to um, both make develop these ideas and, and make it more con concrete, do some more research um, and make them a little bit more complex and also work with us, whether that be remotely or in real life to incorporate these ideas. And, and we're really excited about that. We, we hope you guys are too. So this opportunity is, is available to all participants, whether, you, whether you're a finalist or not. Um, and we'll be sending out an, uh, an application to join this team after. So, so we really hope that you can continue to work on the ideas that you've made this ecothon with us through this design lab. And uh, so stick around um, to the end to the end of the event where we will be uh, telling you guys a little bit more information about about how to how to join this design lab. Yeah. So just to add on, we imagine that eventually this will become um, a model, a shelter where um, people can come and visit. They can have a look at the kind of technology we've tested out. Um, and we want to explore a bunch of ideas and we're going to be picking up ideas from everything that we have received today. Um, yeah, and so it'll be both a way to test out that technology and for people to like uh, become more aware of new technology and the need for action um, to solve the environmental uh, catastrophe. I also want to say um, it's been so much fun um, getting to know everyone. It's been such a pleasure to see all of um, all of the ideas and how uh, they've been communicated, how they how they've been brainstormed and then decided upon and then communicated. And uh, we're so excited for the presentations today. Um, unfortunately, only five teams will be presenting, but um, that doesn't mean that all of the ideas weren't great. We're really, really happy with how, with how it turned out. Um, and there's an opportunity in this for everyone. And we really hope that everyone has taken away a lot of learning from this experience. Um, yeah, and just to reiterate uh, what Shivi was saying about there being an opportunity for, um, for everyone is that all participants will be um, will be eligible to join this design lab and all participants will be featured on our website, their projects um, and what they created with their actual presentations on this website. Uh, on another page we'll add after the event. Um, finalists will get special recognition on the website and they won't have to apply. They'll be just automatically be eligible to join. But since we know that this is a team, um, this, this was a team event and, and sometimes things happen with teams and, and, and there's extenuating circumstances that maybe mask like the talent of a member of the team or, or because of time zones, teams couldn't work as well together. This opportunity we, is open to all teams, whether you're a finalist or not. We'll be sending out an application and, and we really wanna work with, with all of you guys and, and whoever's interested in exploring these ideas further with us. Um, and to answer your question, Jean, yes, all the slideshows will be shared from this event. They already have um, been on the Slack and yes, we'll publish them on the website. So thank you for the question. Um, is there anything else? We can... um, yeah, I think Peter is gonna talk for a little bit now about, about some things that through his experience he wants to share with all, all of our participants. Thank you, Shrey. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so we have this incredible opportunity together today to talk some more with all of you very talented, young, capable people from different parts of the world. I want to help you look a bit into your future. For some of you, it may be three years, some of you maybe five, six years, but it is gonna be in all of your futures. Just take a look at this screenshot I'm sharing with you. What is your emotional reaction when you see this? It's from the New York Times from about a week ago. The robots are coming for Phil, who works in accounting. Workers with college degrees and specialized training once felt relatively safe from automation. They are not. This applies to all of you young people and also for many of your parents. So you have this USB who is employee of the month. Some of you might be thinking, well, that may happen in the future. 
In reality, it's already been happening for years very quietly in the back offices of many corporations who may already are employers of your parents or might be employers of you in the near future. So I want you to think about what would make someone want to hire you when you become ready to work in the labor force. Now, some of you may choose to become entrepreneurs and do your own startup, which is one way to go, but it's very, very stressful and very risky. Most of you probably will end up working for somebody else, working for an employer. So ask yourself, why would an employer pay you to work for them when they can turn to a piece of software to do much of their work for them? The software will not complain, will not call in sick, will not wake up late. And overnight, the software can be updated. They won't sue the employer. So there are many, many advantages to using automation instead of people. So ask yourself, why would someone want to hire you besides you being a nice person? I want you to be very aware of the nature of competition you will face in a few years. Some of the competition will come from other people. Some of them live in low cost countries where they speak English very well. They're very astute with computers like countries like Romania and Estonia, maybe countries you haven't thought about much, but those companies are positioning themselves to provide low cost, high quality human workers for the corporations around the world. How can you compete against them? Also software. There are a number of different studies that compare human workers, experts in their respective fields against a piece of software written to do similar work. And every other month, it seems, another study reveals that algorithms are outperforming human experts. What you see in front of you is a report from about three years ago comparing human lawyers against software to do some basic review of standard contracts. And in this study, which any of you can look up, called Logix 2018, the software outperformed humans. This was three years ago. The software advancements are improving exponentially. So imagine what software can do. There's a company called Ross, and their slogan is chilling for humans. Do more than humanly possible. They take away the mundane work of discovery from many attorneys, much, much, much faster, much more accurate, much cheaper. In medicine, many people say, oh, but there are some human jobs that simply cannot be done by robots or computers. Well, one by one, they're falling to the all powerful algorithms. Here's a study done about a year ago, comparing artificial intelligence, in detecting different forms of breast cancer. And once again, the software outperformed the humans. So what can I encourage you to think of? Very simple. Employers hire people that are willing to be held accountable. What does that mean to be held accountable? It's very simple. It means if you say to someone, I will get this done, you will find a way to get it done. You will move heaven and earth to get it done, regardless of the hardship to you. You will get it done no matter what. If you can do that time and time again, you will become invaluable to your employers. Also enduring ambiguity and uncertainty. These are very uncomfortable sensations, things that when we don't know what's going to happen or things might mean more than one thing. That's what ambiguity means. And I use the word enduring for a good reason, because it's, it's not so much a skill as a willingness to deal with very difficult emotions. Many different cultures have their own expression for hard work. In the US culture, many English speaking countries, hard work, when people say hard work, they think of maybe a person toiling, maybe digging a ditch or laying bricks. And they think, yeah, that's, I think I know what hard work means. But in some cultures, the expression for hard work has much more deeper significance. For example, I grew up in the Asian culture and from a very young age, the expression we used in Mandarin Chinese for hard work is not hard work. It's chukwu. Chukwu means to eat bitterness or swallow bitterness. Can you see the expression conveys 
a different sense of what hard work means. It means it's going to be unpleasant. You're going to do it anyway. And you're going to do something that you may not want to do, but it's something that needs to be done. My last point is, in the US at least, there's a great deal of emphasis from teachers, educators, counselors, parents, about passion, about following your passion of when you're a young person, what should you do for your future? Well, follow your passion, find your passion. I don't, I don't think that's a very good piece of advice. I have a different piece of advice. Make yourself useful. Because if you think that you have to feel passion for something to put your full energies into it, then you may not want to do things that should be done, that employers will want you to do. Also, some people at a young age don't really know what their passion is. I think a better piece of advice is find a way to be good at whatever you do and whatever employers want you to do. But do it very, very well. And by making yourself useful, employers will seek you out, pay you very well, give you great benefits, which then frees you to have a great life, to do other fun things when you're away from work. Just remember this image. Software is coming for you, not just Phil. Back to you, Shrey and Shivy. Thank you for that, Peter. Yeah, I think that's definitely important for people to know, for, uh, people to know in this, in this day and age. Um, and it's definitely advice that I know me and Shivy will, will try to take. And I hope that a lot of our participants will try to, try to take into account. So for the next 10 minutes, while we're waiting for the judges to finish up judging and um, inform us of the finalists, uh, can we just have a conversation? How are we feeling? Um, how's our experience been? <laughs> are we excited? Are we nervous? What did you think about the ideas? Anything you're taking away? Does anyone want to start? A bold person, risk taker. Who's it gonna be? Pick somebody. It should be pick okay. someone and have that person either speak or pass, and then they can name someone else. I think bold would want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then I realized that after joining Ecoton, I realized that I there were lots of things that I weren't aware aware of because we looked at different aspects of ecocentric housing, right? We looked at energy, water consumption, and things like that. Insulation. And then we realize how little details can play a huge role when it comes to reducing the carbon emission. Because just by looking at the light bulb, a normal light bulb produces about 152 kilograms of carbon dioxide each year, while an LED only produces around, I think it, it was 16 or something. This huge difference made me realize how dumb and how foolish I was because usually when I imagine those changes, I wouldn't imagine them to have such huge impacts. I would imagine to be like maybe Maybe it can be 60% more effective, but then looking at the scale, it really comes down to a lot because it's at least thousands of kilograms in difference when it comes to carbon dioxide emissions. So I realized that after researching, I've been much more aware about the things I've been using and the energy consumption. Thank you for that, Baldwin. Yeah, it's definitely a very important point. And, and we're glad that you got that from this experience. Um, yeah, and, and I hope that you also got from this experience with, with some things that you don't know, especially with our amazing mentors, that it, like the, uh, the, the advantages of being curious and asking questions. I, I know that I definitely still do struggle with that um, and just you know, like utilizing resources that and, and knowing that a lot of people want to help you figure out this stuff. Um, so, yeah. Um, anyone else that want to talk about? What they've what they've thought about the experience and or 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 how they what they've thought of working with other people from other, around the world if they have. Rania, do you want to go? You can choose to pass if you want. It's fine. I'll go. Um, well, this experience was actually um, a lot of fun because I wasn't before Ecothon. I wasn't too interested in the sustainable like architecture and. Uh, stuff because I never really figured I had the brains for it or the niche for it. But um, working uh, yesterday and today with my group members, it was a lot of fun and they're all really smart. So it, it was a lot of fun working with them and figuring out um, sustainable solutions to problems that 
um, our respective countries might face, like especially in Bangladesh, we addressed like, um, I'll just reveal a little bit of what our group did in like, we uh, wanted to build houses for people in the slum and we targeted a tropical area like Bangladesh. So it was fun seeing that things could be done differently here, you know, than maybe what authorities are doing currently. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I want to say something. Um, oh, wow, I forgot. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe someone else can go to then. Oh, uh, yeah, I remember. It was really nice to reconnect with some people. Like, um, there's some people from AISD, American International School of Dhaka, um, who are here with us. We have um, Rania, uh, we have Arzu also. No, not Arzu. Arzu? Yes, okay, Arzu, sorry. Um, we have uh, Siri, who I hadn't met before, but Sri and I attended um, AISD when we lived in Bangladesh. So that's been really nice. Um, I got to meet... Um, some people from Mexico. That was fun because I got to practice my Spanish. Um, <laughs> um, also, Baldwin's from AISD. Um, I got to meet Tanvi Sood, and uh, she's from she, she's in Jakarta right now, but she was also in AISD with Shrey and me. So that was a lot of fun. It, I really enjoyed interacting with new people and with um, old friends. That is my uh, input. Does anyone else want to go now? I think we have the final teams ready, Shivi. We do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I'll just announce them right now. And we'll keep you waiting. Um, so, the five finalist teams are Team Six, Team Thirteen, Team Seven, Team Four, and Team Ten. Um, let me read through. Um, you read through some of these names. Um, or actually, yeah, you guys should know which teams you're from, so uh, it should be fine. But yeah, again, congratulations to um, our five finalist teams. Um, and and we really want to reiterate to non-finalist teams that we all the ideas we got and all the teams we were judging were much, much better than what we initially thought. And we, we were really surprised at how, how capable all of you guys were. And everyone will have a chance to work with us if they want after um, after this event uh, with our six month design lab and everyone will be featured on our website. Um, so without further ado, I think we're gonna move the five finalist teams to breakout rooms um, right now where they will, uh, they will be working with mentors um, to prepare a five to seven minute verbal presentation and which will be judged by the same um, which will be judged by the same rubric that judged the initial presentations, but this time all the judges will be judging all presentations and, um, and it'll account for the verbal element of the presentation too. So the breakout rooms are open. So please, the five finalist teams we just announced, please go to the same rooms that you went into yesterday. Just go to the, the breakout room whose number matches your team number. So team six, for example, go to the breakout room team six and you'll have a mentor joining you shortly. Um, could you please move me to the team seven breakout room? You should be able to do it yourself. I, I enabled everyone to do it yourself. Can you try to do that? Uh, hello, sir. Okay, it seems like non finalist teams are also some non finalist teams are also joining breakout rooms. Well, if they want to, that that's fine. But but uh, yeah, everyone should be able to move themselves at this point. So so for example, Eric Kachadurban, can you move yourself to room thirteen? You should be able to do that. Where, where's the, the selection? To do look, look, look up uh, breakout room tab to the bottom. I think if you click there, it should allow you to move into whichever room you choose. Um, there's a, a, a tab for the breakout room, you said? Yeah, it, to the bottom of the screen, when you uh, move your cursor to the bottom, um, like next to the 
a tab for reactions or recording. Okay. Do, do you um, see such a tab? I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Hmm. I'm, that's strange. Some people are able to move themselves. Others are, others are not. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, then, then the, uh, I will, I will move you. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's odd. Okay. Okay. No, the non-finalist teams do not need to go to breakout rooms. We're going to be watching a video, a TED talk by Dan. Oh, I think I think most of them do. Yeah. So if if you can pop, you two can pop into those. So some of the other rooms and tell invite them back in the main room, or or I can move them one by one. Yeah. Uh, can you maybe? Uh, Actually, um, okay. Room eight needs help. Let me see. With room eight. Okay. Darin. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah. So we were uh, not in the finalist team. What are we supposed team. to do here? Second. What are we supposed to do in this breakout room? Oh, actually, you all go back to the main room. Uh, the, 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 oh. It's going to be a video for everyone to watch. Oh, but we. It doesn't let me. Okay, uh, team. I ask team eight to come back to the main room. Uh, Peter, can you maybe a co-host? Yeah. Um, Maho, so only the finalist teams are going into the breakout rooms right now. Uh, oh, that's why. Okay. Thank you. I'll be working on. Uh, okay. So Kristen, can you pick yourself one of the rooms to join as the mentor for finalist teams? And the rest of us, like Javier too, can you pick one? And Shubham, can you pick a room to join? Okay. Yeah, I can, I can join team 13. Okay. I will join team. Well, okay. I would join whichever teams is left. So join team nine or does that already have someone in there? Team nine is not a finalist team. Okay. I can join team 10. Okay. Okay. I would jo join team six. Okay. I'll join team six. Um, what, what rooms are left? Four. Four. Okay. Then I'll pick that option. Yeah. Okay. Should we move out now? Yeah. Y'all have 30 minutes to help them create a little presentation. 30 minutes. Um, while at the same time increasing the insulation of the overall structure. Hi, Team 6. Hello. Hello. Y'all did extremely well in judging. Oh, I was very impressed. Thank okay. you. <laughs> and 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 um, Shibi told me that your original video was too long, and so you 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 remade it. I think you just spoke faster, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like we had to cut down parts. Oh. That's so good. <laughs> yeah, very it well done. Literally sounds like we're rapping. We're like what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> it was very well done. Okay, so Thank we have about you. half an hour to prepare for your presentation. Um, based on your video and your slides, it, it looks really well done already. So what you may want to think about is anticipate what questions you may get from the judges, right? Because it's, it's, it sounds like the quality of a presentation and a video shows me you two have already coordinated, or three have yeah. already coordinated, so you know what to say, right? So yes. just be ready, just imagine what kinds of issues? Maybe I can help you with that because I will. Yeah. I will pretend I'm looking at a slide for the first time, and I will okay. start asking you questions based on. So yeah. let me go to your slide number six. Okay. I love. This is amazing. I love it too. Yeah. We okay. stayed all night and worked our ass off on this. Well, yeah. it's, it shows the the level of quality is really really high. It it shows. It's reflected in the quality of your work. Okay. Yeah. So, and then we were also asking each other questions in the process. Like we were yeah. just like, 
okay, so how many percent of the heat is lost through the roof? And then we, we just keep quizzing each other until like we knew the numbers ourselves. Wow. That's really impressive that you and would, like, they would work so yeah. hard on this. And then we knew like different information that we were missing in the beginning. Like, like you know, like how plants, like they reduce sound pollution, but yes. how? So like we had to yeah. go through all of that. So then we just figure out that it's through sound attenuation where the twigs of the plants and parts of the plants is um, just Absor deflect like deflecting, deflecting the sound waves. Okay, so I'm I'm looking through I'm on a slide deck right now. I'm looking at slide, I'm looking at slide number seven, which seven. is who is yes. the audience, right? Okay, so you're you're looking at four thousand kilometers from the kilometer from the equator. Four thousand yes. kilometers. Okay, um, why did you pick that number? Four thousand kilometers. So we felt like the reason that we picked 4,000 kilometers was because everything, we felt that at least regions between 4,000 kilometers to the equator line had some sort of um, similarities and that would be the tropical climate because for example, in areas of Nepal, India, Bangladesh, we see the weather's lasting in the range around 15 Celsius degrees and 32 Celsius degrees on average. So then we thought that this was a good range as our countries are also quite focusing on South and Southeast Asia yeah. and these these tend to have similar climates. Uh, what you've done on slide seven is very well done, but you're missing the most important piece of data. Okay. Which is a large part of human population lives within that band. That's the real mm -hmm. reason you're picking it, right? Because if you pick that band for the temperature, but no one lives here, it's irrelevant. <laughs> mm. All right. right. Yeah. And, and, and it's not only a large mm -hmm. segment of the population, but a large segment of the poor population. Because yeah, that will need that will need the price range that we've kept. Yeah, because, because it's only thirteen hundred. Because if, if if you're very poor, you probably could not survive in the Arctic because you'll die from exposure mm -hmm. to the harsh temperature. But along the equator, the temperature is mild enough. So even if you're very very poor, you can probably still survive by living outdoors. So the equator is a very good <laughs> choice. But just the one thing you're missing is about what percent of a population lives around the equator. I think something like a third. Or okay. maybe even more than maybe a third, I think. So that's a very good reason why you chose it. But just add that point, like you know, on like two billion people <laughs> live in this band. Ninety percent. Ninety? Nine zero? No, it's north, north of the equator. Never mind. Or um, and, and then um, Abhilasha, we're also focusing on like south. I think we can search for the population of southeast, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Yeah. Also, we're also um, uh, we're also selecting this part of the world, like this region of the world, because like our um, sourcing of materials for that price range is around these countries. Like bamboos are less expensive and can be locally resourced when it comes to these countries. And like certain, like even like um, when you even when you come towards like you know like labor cost and everything, it's yes. less expensive when it comes to these countries. Yes. Okay, that's that's good. Okay, so just, just make sure you add that piece of data around um, the uh, percent of population that's around there. Like, just estimate. Uh, I mean, if you, if you if you type in Google, like what what percent of um, population live near equator? Live hmm. near equator. It's okay that we'll just verbally back these up, right? Because we can't add yeah. change. You can. I, I just changed the editing, right? So you can change it now. You can go ahead and oh. change it. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I'm looking. Uh, I'm looking at world population by latitude. Uh, I'm looking at that website. See if. Uh, oh yeah, this is okay. Yeah, this is a nice. Okay. Okay, so here, here, here's here's um I'm gonna I'm gonna post it onto uh, the side of uh, slide six so you can see it. You see that this graphic? Oh yeah. So it shows you this graphic shows yeah. you the majority of the world population lives around the equator. <laughs> and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll share the link of this. This this comes from this this source. Um, should we add this in our um, 
Yeah, I think I think it'd be good to, and and this reference you can put, uh, I guess, on your last slide, the MarySue.com, World Population Latitude Longitude. Yeah. I'll press in the next slide, right? The audience slide. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you should also do the Emily. Wait, I'll do the Emily part. Yeah. And then just uh, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it. Okay. So one. So since we're also focusing on like the Southeast Asia and South Asia, I'll just look for the population in South Asia and in Southeast Asia, and then combine them together. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm looking at slide. On seven, um, no eight. I'm looking at bamboo now. Okay. Okay. Great idea, but you're also not putting something. Another good reason why you're using bamboo. Why? Why did you choose bamboo? Um, because uh, the tensile strength uh, strength of bamboo is pretty high, and another thing, it's it's locally. It can be locally resourced. Yes. And uh, number three yeah. is um, bamboo. You can you can manually even fit it. So like labor cost also decreases with that. Yes. And uh, mm. number fourth is um, that over time, even if you have to replace it, there is no um, like waste material that is not environment friendly. Yes. Mm. And, and also bamboo in certain parts, I remember reading about this, certain parts of uh, Southeast Asia, like in Vietnam, bamboo that's mature can grow up to four, up to 1.2 meters per day. In height, it's ridiculous oh. how fast it grows. It, it, bamboo is a grass; it's not a tree. It's a grass, so it grows extremely fast. So it's it's very it's a very good form of biomass you can use. And, and if you have and, and so bamboo can be used for many parts of the house. So I think it's a great choice. But just note that it's a very very fast growing, and and yeah. re re replenishable, right? And and it will sequester carbon dioxide as it grows. Hmm. Terrorist guard. Oh, yeah, so and bamboos also have a greater tensile strength than metal, in which they have more flexibility in yes. what they might fold in. Yeah, that's so right. And in Hong Kong, they still use bamboo scaffolding for high rises when they build high rises. <laughs> Even today, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I was shocked when I saw how strong it was. Yeah, amazing, huh? Yeah. And also, I, it, I, yeah. no, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that um, I know I didn't really do a lot with the bamboo or the ideas, but I was just going to say that if you wanted to add something to the presentation, it's that bamboo, even if untreated, can last by itself like five years and 10 years if it's treated properly. So if you harvest it and use it for this, it will last very long by itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like just... other like metal is like much more or certain metals are much more corrosive as roofing. Yeah. Mm. Let me just go to, go to the audience slide and add approximately 2.5 billion population. Okay. Bamboo. This is audience. Okay, so what? Why bamboos has a greater tensile strength? Um, could be locally That's, found. Um, is it uh, does not create any wet waste even if we have to replace them. Uh, it lasts for up to five years untreated and if treated properly up to 10 years, it's replenish replenishable. It can go extremely fast and it's an extreme good form of biomass. Okay. I've jotted it down. Well, okay, uh, let me just kind of also put it on the slide because I think they would want to know why bamboos. Yeah, also okay we found grows fast. Yeah, and then we can just Wait. elaborate. Oh, so I'll be like, so we'll go with the same order, right? Like you'll do the bamboo and collection system. Yeah. Wait, and, and then I'll just keep adding on to what you say. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. And then you can try to add on what I'm gonna say with um, Terrace Garden. Okay. 
and get them. Yeah. So, so the the terrace garden serves many purposes. One of which is to reduce overall heat transfer. It's a form of insulation, right? And also, it collects rainwater. So you offer more surface area to collect rainwater that might otherwise be wasted, un unharvested, yeah. right? So it's, that's very clever. Yeah. The, the the one question I have of our homeowner is, this sounds like it takes quite a bit of engineering to make sure that the terrace garden does not collapse into the house, right? Because oh. that would be, that would be, it would be, be, be a very heavy roof. You've got the soil and the water and also the roots. Um, what, what if we use sand and um, like sand in little pebbles instead of like soil or like uh, coconut husk? Good source of protein, but like light weight. Oh, um, I I also looked a bit into this, and with the water draining into the system, um, into the building, there should be no problem because there are um, very cheap um, local waterproof um, glues in which it works similar to a waste insulation tape would work by sealing through the leaks. Mm -hmm. So then, just by applying that layer, it prevents the water leaking to the okay. entire house. Okay. So an another re reason that I suggested that sand and like pebbles uh -huh. was that it also filtrates water. Yeah, at the same time. that's clever. Yeah. Yeah. Won't so you also have like filtrated water in the tank. Yeah. And it's oh. also not heavy for like the roof because we're also using like coconut husk sand and uh, like pebbles are not that heavy as compared to like soil, like just like soil because coconut husk are used at indoor plants. For like would, is sand strength. difficult to get for people who live near the equator who, who may not? Oh, uh, no, have that? I don't think Wait. so because we have riverbeds. Hmm. I, 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 but like, what if instead of with sand and coconut things, why don't we do soil? Because won't sand absorb the water and then it'll become heavier? It, isn't that a property of sand? No, actually, water goes right through sand, it's very porous. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it also filtrates the water. Yeah, yeah. Th th there is an established way of filtering, filtering water. It's through sand. Yeah, it's just... It's called, it's called dual media uh, filtration. Yeah. And you use sand, uh, larger pebbles, and smaller pebbles. Yes. And then you filter the water. Yeah. It's so, used everywhere so, in Nepal as well. I did, 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 did also use the wet, wet approach where they actually encourage the growth of a film of bacteria? Um, no, it's, there's like running as there is running water mm -hmm. um since we already have the plants i don't think that's going to be a lot bigger issue but mm -hmm. in regards to the houses that are that the filtration systems that are kept in the houses in Nepal, what they do is like there's always running water and they change it every um like um two years or three years but like there's no actual waste that is like going to go to like landfills or something they'll just like keep it in their terrace garden or something because that works fine too yeah Okay, I'm looking at slide 13. Gold sedum or low cost for huge covering. Okay, so using gold sedum as a as simply as biomass, right? To create to create transpiration of a plant, which cools the house. Oh uh, yes. So insulation. Like, okay. The reason with gold sedum is because, as you can see, like from the picture, the leaves are kind of small, uh -huh. and it's better that the leaves are smaller because that leaves less gaps for like the air to move around and then trapping mm -hmm. the molecules in between. Mm -hmm. So then by using these smaller grass, um, smaller grass as well with the addition of vines. Yeah. So, so these, are, this idea you got from- It's great insulation. So these are ideas also, you got from, I'm sorry, go ahead. I blush Go ahead. Uh, also, another thing that I researched about gold sedan is that even though it's not native to trop tropical climate, they can still like, like, they can still like, are like really good plants that like grow well in like tropical climate regions. Okay, I'll, good. I'll just, I was about yeah, to ask I'm, you that. Okay. That's good. With the gold idea, um, we... We, we, we didn't copy it anywhere from other place. Instead, we kind of took it as our idea because we looked at like different plants and yeah. then we came up with the conclusion that maybe gold would be the best option yeah. since it requires low maintenance. As well. Okay, so um, I'm looking at your last uh, slide 14 for the budget. Natural lighting costs a lot of money. Uh, why is it 
so expensive? Is it the cost of windows? It's uh, the cost of glass. Glass. Yeah. So cost of glass. Yes. Yeah, glass is very expensive. So like we also tried finding some substitute for glass. So we but were like thinking, substitute glasses are even more expensive than like glass. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. I mean you you you've so done like your if we research. go towards like a more yeah, yeah. If, if we go towards like more eco-friendly options about glass, there's like mm -hmm. plexiglass, right? That's about eight thousand dollars per window. But when we come towards like these type of windows, then yeah. it's like a little less expensive for us. Yeah. Even if we locally resource them, it's less expensive. And it's also because like the country since um I like it's not me to offend anyone, but like there are more developing countries in like the South Asia and Asia region, um, Southeast yes. Asia region. So they yeah. also like the technology to make such eco-friendly yeah. glasses. So that's why they're expensive. And and those water tubs, yeah. they're quite expensive as well. They they made of plastic, right? The big water, um, big water yeah. containers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Two five thousand liter. Like, uh -huh. Wait, two two there five. There is a substitute. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yes. It, it should be two five thousand no. liter tanks, not five thousand milliliter tanks, right? Two five thousand liter tanks. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yes. And uh, and they're, they're made of plastic, right? Yeah, they're these are made of plastics. These are the only issues that we have. Okay. No, but the. The, the thing with this being plastic is also because it would last the longest. I see. Yeah, it will last the longest if it's... So what I've researched is that mm -hmm. if we make like wells or if we make like, um, you know, like how concrete rings uh, like tank, like they yes. make ring, like they make tanks out of concrete rings. So yes. the problem that arises there, like in that vicinity is that having to have like a ground level water um, like ground level water tank will have us to in, like will make will uh, will result in us for to like increase the pump um, usage, which will like increase the carbon emission even more. Ah, and even, nice. if we, even if even if we have like tanks that are made out of like concrete, then the problem is that over time they are more likely to have like moss build up. I see. Their, okay. Oh. Rather than the plastic ones. Wow, you you've so, like, done your these, research. That's great. Yeah, these la and then we can wash these. So like they like they go on towards like thirty years, like okay. thirty five years if you're like up to date with like washing them. You you got your data. That's great. Okay, I think last nine minutes, just you two rehearse who's going to say what at which point in time. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're ready. Yeah. You're, you're very ready. That's great. Okay. okay, so so I will I will leave and leave you two alone, the three of you alone to rehearse. You are ready. You've got your facts. Okay. Good luck to y'all. Great work. Thank here. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I found that quite interesting. I really like how um, you talked about the idea of being weird but completely natural and not fulfilling other people's expectations. I found that very interesting. And I feel like it's something that I used to think a lot about when I was younger and I tried to um, live that way. But I think as I've been growing older, I'm forgetting that that's how I wanted to live my life, to just embrace my normality and my weirdness. Maybe that's where the need to fulfill expectations and to conform to society, maybe that's where we're also um, losing out on ways that we could actually be making less of an impact to the environment. Because we all know that the way our society functions today is not good for the environment. So I just wrote down some questions that came to my mind while I was listening. Feel free to write your own questions. Also, I, I want to share with you an audience that Dan Phillips is somebody I met. Um, actually, Javier, one of the mentors, and I and my wife went to visit Dan Phillips on the construction site. 
of three of his homes. We were very lucky that we lived only about an hour away from his construction site in Texas many years ago. And what we found was a very gentle person who wanted to serve single mothers who often had no form of income, who had children. And what he did was he made it possible for the single mothers to not only own their own house, but more importantly, to learn how to build their own house. So he would tell his long list of potential customers, only if you're willing to learn how to build a house with me and build your house with me will I work with you. Because he wanted to not just provide a house, but provide a means for the woman to improve it and fix it and feel empowered. Because many of the women that he served had abusive relationships with their boyfriends or husbands. So he wanted to lift them up besides giving them a chance to have their own house. A, a very, a very just like Dr. Caroline Bailey, a, a humanitarian, uh, social justice minded individual. I'm very honored to have met him and, and see his work in person. I remember going to see one of his houses where he took uh, lots of um, old pieces of uh, CDs and he said, he said, if you have only one CD, it's a piece of trash, but if you make a thousand CDs into a wall, then it's a giant mirror. And sure enough, we saw this beautiful dance studio where there was no mirror except a thousand CDs would serve as a mirror. And the floors were coated with, I think, um, bo bottle caps and cork. Yeah, so share that with you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, wait, quick question here. Are you, were, are, is your team ready? That's why you came back. The team you were helping out. Oh, you're muted. Um, yeah, and in five minutes, right, we'll start the presentations. Yeah. So, um, I saw uh, in the introductions, and I think when we when we sent out an email asking for your bios, I saw that some of us uh, were Fridays for Future youth activists, and some of us um, are part of Extinction Rebellion. Is anyone here right now? Yes, I I told that yes. Sophia, um, I have a question for you, and it's something um, I think okay. about a lot. Um, you know, there are people who criticize activists and, and there's like this stigma around activism where people think, and I'm just like, I'm just telling you what I've heard. People think activists can be people who, uh, who preach what they do not practice and they're demanding things and they're angry. You know, that's the kind of image we have of activists. Yeah. What do you have to say about that as an activist? Uh, well, it it depends a lot on the movement because, for example, Fridays for Future is a really pacific movement, so we don't have like that much criticism. Um, well, for example, here in Mexico, yes, because it's like an European movement and kind mm. of because of that, but I think that it's actually not true. I mean, yes, we all contribute to the carbon footprint that exists in the world, but we have to take into account who are the people that are causing it. Like we are all part of a system, but at the end, the ones that we should be blaming are like the enterprises that don't make the like, I don't know how to say it, like the um, measurements needed and the government. So like we as an individual can contribute to the cause, but at the end, we are not going to solve them because it comes from something really bigger and that has to treat has to be treated with lots of measure. So yeah, I think it's that. Like it's not that I don't take individual action. It's just that I can't make all the people take individual action. And for example, it's just like one percent of the global population, the ones that are making most of the most of the pollution and of the greenhouse um gases so yeah i think that it's my point okay i have a similar point of view um but i'm still confused like i don't have a fully formed opinion yet um i think activists are so important 
because we need to have some people who are fighting against the system, who are being angry. If we don't have that, then you know where, when, when and where is the systemic change gonna come from? But uh, an interesting question is if systemic change at like big um, governmental level is the way to go, then is individual action even worth taking? Things like going vegan, things like going zero waste, things like, um, you know, things that on the global scale are relatively smaller, are they even worth investing time and energy in? Yeah, because um, that you're doing a little action does not mean that you're not doing anything. And for example, um, in my particular case and in cases that I have observed from my friends, because um, well, I was part of Fridays for Future, but then I started like my own collective in my school with all my team. So, yeah, <laughs> so what I have been watching uh, these past two years that I have been doing this is that when people see you take action, they probably will take it too and they will like start doing things. So, for example, I could meet Laura in Reese's and she, if she was like <laughs> using plastic, she would take it away so I wouldn't see it. But then she would start not to do it. So that's like the whole point, like the inspiring point. Well, and yeah, I will. You said something at the beginning, but I don't remember what you said. But the whole point is like taking individual action so you can like also be in peace with yourself, know that you are doing something because yeah, some things are more for that. And also inspiring other people and building kind of a community of people that can help to the problem. And the whole point of activism is to, like, I'm only 17. I don't know exactly which are the laws that have to be made in my country. Like, I have an idea and I can read, but at the end, I don't have a bachelor in politics. So we need to... We need to ask the people that are trained to do the things, to do their job and to help us and to help us survive. And yeah, that's like the whole point. That was very okay. nice. I agree with you. Very nicely put. Uh, I have a few more questions. You said something about how um, Fridays for Future is a European uh, movement, like it started in Europe. And um, that's why some people feel a bit weird about people about countries like uh, Mexico or India joining the movement. And I agree with you because I was part of a Fridays for Future movement, uh, a, a Fridays for Future climate strike here in Gurgaon too. I did get that from some people. Um, so I think that was a good point. And then another question I had was about veganism. Um, and the whole the whole idea of dairy and meat being a big contributor to the climate crisis. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, first, like all the, here in Mexico, all the things of uh, Fridays for Future being an European movement, it's that um, here we have a word that it's called white chicken, which means that you are, <laughs> you are someone of Mexico who's trying to uh, like imitate or believe that you are from Europe or from United States, so you are like changing your color, right? Right again. So uh, it has been like a lot of criticism. Like we are trying to to be more like Europe or to copy that. But um, I'm no longer in Fridays for Future mainly because I didn't have time and because of the collective that I have made. But um, the whole point is to be adjusting to each country. So Fridays for Future in Europe or in the United States will not be the same as Fridays for Future in Mexico because we center on problematics in Mexico and same with any Fridays for Future in the world. We have like common areas of work, like for example, the Agenda 2030, but we also have like a specific causes that are in each of the countries. And on veganism, I really believe it's important. 
it's there are like lots of stereotypes here in Mexico I cannot speak like for all the countries but I don't know because of the prices that vegan food have here it's a lot more expensive so many people say that they couldn't like transform to a more vegan way of living but the third is that most of the the products that are vegan are really um, accessible if, first if you make them yourself and second if other people would buy it because for example one case is like all these milks that are made with with other materials or with other with other ingredients um they are really expensive here like 60 pesos which would be like three dollars um when most milk is in one dollar but the thing is is because people don't buy the milk so if we started like consuming more products and finding like accessible ways of of eating more vegan it would be better and it will really help the environment and there are also like lots of debates regarding the nutrition that a vegan diet can have in you and if it's like prejudicial but um there are really lots of ways to balance your diet without the need of meat uh like consuming more more protein that comes from other like grains for example most of my friends do that like they eat more and more grains in every meal so that they can like balance it so yeah it's just like we really need to inform people and to like make things clear because the stereotypes and the false information and the things that we hear because we are like used to it can really um, be like a, an obstacle for people to really understand the problem and understand in which ways they can act and also like we need to you don't necessarily have to be completely vegan. You can like start small and of course sometimes you're not going to be able to not eat meat because you're in a meeting or something. But the point is like to have that point of view and that perspective where you try to do something for other than yourself. Yeah, um, um I feel like People who claim to be environmentalists or, or people who are interested in protecting the environment, sometimes they face a lot of criticism from people who themselves feel guilty in their presence. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, um, yeah, but I think it's important to understand that, that as environmentalists, um, criticism is going to come, but it's not necessarily directed at you. And it shouldn't be taken personally because I know I have been discouraged because of criticism. Um, but I wish people would understand that as people who care about the environment, we're not trying to be perfect. We're just trying to make a difference in the way that we can. And um, it's okay not to be perfect. And if everyone did things in imperfect ways, but still had the mindset that you were talking about, we would be actually be able to make a really big impact. Yeah like the whole problem is that i have passed there like when you start in a movement and you realize like all the problems that the environmental crisis have you really panic it's like really i i have read about that it's like cry, climate anxiety or something um so people really really can panic and when you when you learn all of this you can like get shocked and and like encourage other people to get like that so it's like a, a process where you need to understand like your limits your actual limits and that you cannot control like the people around you and that we are all going to mess up in any point and we have to understand like the whole point is to have this perspective where we help the environment and to encourage other people to do them, but also not force them. Because um, at the end, we live like in a culture where it's not, where it's something new. So, yeah. Thank you, Sophia. That was a fun conversation. 
And I hope it was informative or in some way beneficial to all of our participants. Um, everyone is back in the main room now, and I'm hoping all of our mentors are here as well. We're going to be starting with our presentation soon, but before we do that, I just want to take a second to um, thank all of our mentors. We have Peter Hahn, we have Misha, we have Shubham, we have Javier, and we have Kristen. So I just want to thank you on behalf of Ecothon 20, 2021 for being here, for all your support and um, being so proactive and, um, and contributing so much uh, with your expertise to our event and to our participants. And I wanna uh, give a special thank you to Peter um, without whom this event would not have been possible. Uh, thank you so much. Can we have everyone just like clapping for our mentors for the amazing job they've done? <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, awesome. um, so without further ado, we're going to begin presentations. Um, um, we'll start with Team Tim. Um, if Team Tim could, uh, could if, if anyone Team Tim has, um, can screen share, um, please tell us and we'll make you a co-host. I don't think they need to be co-hosts. I think anyone can share. Okay. Team okay. 10? It should work now. Right. Ask you to share. Hi, everyone. We're just 10, and I am Tomzi, and we have to be with Nina, and today we will be presenting our eco-friendly structure, which we have named as Garuda, as we like, as that's the national bird of Indonesia, and we thought it would make our structure more special. Uh, so moving on to the problem aspect of this um, presentation, the first eco-friendly concept that we will be focusing on is ocean pollution slash plastic pollution because these are really, really big problems in Indonesia. Indonesia is the second biggest contributor of plastic pollution in the ocean and especially in agricultural and coastal communities. There isn't a proper um, waste management system that is put into place, which leads to negative effects on the marine ecosystem because this buildup of waste affects um, the sea creatures as it endangers them. And it also has health risks to um, the community and the residents living inside these um, agricultural and coastal communities. So this has large effects on um, people's incomes as well, because it puts many jobs into risk, uh, such as fishermen jobs um, or jobs in the tourism industry. And the second um, eco-friendly concept that we will be focusing on is energy consumption, because increases in energy consumption lead to um, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. And Indonesia currently ranks ninth for worst air quality in 2020. So these emissions contribute greatly to climate change, which is especially dangerous in these coastal communities in Indonesia because it causes the sea level to rise, leading to agricultural land loss. And so the third eco-friendly concept is poor infrastructure, which is very prevalent throughout homes in these rural areas in Indonesia because many of these houses as seen by the picture are just built out of scraps and are they're very, very poorly built so that when um, natural disasters come such as floods which are very often which very often occur in Indonesia these houses just completely fall apart so this is something we will be hoping to fix with our structure so the geographical location that we were inspired by was Southeast Asia or more specifically Indonesia focusing more on the rural areas of Indonesia and um, Indonesia is a country quite close to the equator. So there is, um, it's, it's a tropical location with a relatively hot climate. And we were thinking on focusing um, in villages, um, focus on coastal villages or agricultural villages. Um, 
And that being said, our target um, customers or the people that we hope to provide this structure to um, are local Indonesian families of four to five people that are currently living under poorly built households, um, especially um, Indonesians that are farmers or fishermen that are um, experiencing the impacts of plastic pollution and climate change in general. So the raw materials that we decided to use um, to build our house is bamboo sticks, recycled plastic bottles, um, cement between the bottles, bamboo wood, and straw bales, um, which is the um, extra material of recycled after cups are harvested. So this is our solution. We named it Garuda, and this is a rough um, sketch of our exterior for this structure. So we plan for it to be 500 square feet or 46 um, square meters. And the first concept that we implemented was having the walls being um, mainly comprised of recycled plastic bottles, which we will fill with um, cement as well as microplastics and other potentially harmful debris. Um, and by doing this, we hope to re um, reverse the damage of plastic pollution and not only that, um, but it also helps with our target audience as, um, as um, poverty is a relatively large issue in Indonesia with a high poverty rate of 10% of the population being in poverty. Um, using plas um, plastic, which we can get for free um, in ways we will discuss later, lowers the price. And another concept that we implemented was using a lot of bamboo. And this is because um, it is a good substitute for materials like wood timber as it provides an effective carbon sink. And it wouldn't be unusual to um, the Indonesian community as bamboo is a commonly used um, material in Southeast Asian countries, which gives the structure a comfortable and familiar feel while being sustainable at the same time. So this is the interior part of the structure of our, ho of our house. So the third concept is um, straw bale lining, which will be lined on the inside of the roof and also on the inside of the walls. And so the thickness of the straw bale will be around 42 to 45 centimeters. And they'll not only add an aesthetic value, but they'll also um, help reflect heat throughout the room. Um, so these straw bales act as structural insulation panels as straw bales have high insulation values of R30 to R35. So they'll add this sustainable component without um, eliminating the structural insulation value of the home. So um, for our structure, we didn't have a lot of technology involved in it. But um, some main things that we thought were, that were, are important for our um, structure is having metal splitters as we are going to be um, turning the bamboo sh um, sticks into bamboo wood that we will use for the roof and the flooring. Um, and then for the actual um, installation of the house, we will be partnering with KDM and Habitat for Humanity, which are organizations that we will introduce later. And once we're done with the exterior, exterior we will focus on electricity and lighting and other things like that. Uh, we believe that our idea is quite feasible as the main project is made up of recycled materials that are easily accessible. Um, other materials such as cement and straw bales can be easily found in a tropical country like Indonesia. And um, we plan on getting the recycled plastic bottles through beach cleanups that we will talk more about in the next few slides. Um, additionally, if we look at the costs of the materials, it is not too expensive and falls quite near the budget that is given to us while having the benefit of being sustainable and sturdy. So the total price comes just under $2,000. And while this is slightly over the given budget, we believe that we mine the fundings for the house and limited our budget whilst using sustainable materials in order to build a sturdy house that will be beneficial in the long run. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but you have around a minute left. Um, we also believe that our idea is pretty original as we're focusing on in specifically the problems that Indonesia is going through. And we made sure that our design was pretty simple as we had to make sure the, that we were um, talking about 
uh, incorporating elements of poverty in Indonesia and that the, the minimum wage here is pretty cheap and we had to work through that, so yeah. Um, there are a few partnerships that we could work um, with uh, in Indonesia to make our design actually work and be practical. There's an organization known as KDM that focuses on reducing waste and they gather um, people who are under the poverty cycle and they ask them to help make these reusable products as well. And another way that we can collect the plastic bottles would also be by attending attending the numerous beach cleanups that Jakarta holds as Indonesia suffers from ocean pollution. And additionally, there's another organization known as Habitat for Humanity, which focuses on building homes for people who come from lower income families. And as this is an organization that works very closely with our school, we could ask to partner up with them. So basically having these partnerships and working with these organizations can help actually make our structure and idea work and make and that makes it more practical and yeah thank you thank you for that um you know, any mentors uh, any judges have questions yeah, I, I think very intriguing design you have. And I love the way you talk about the audience, the geography and, and the problems you're trying to solve. Your budget uh, was very interesting because the most expensive element by far was a straw, which seems a bit surprising given you mentioned earlier in the slide that straw is made from parts of the rice harvesting that otherwise would be a disposable problem. So are there some ways to lower the cost of straw bales? Now they cost over three quarters of a total budget. Yeah, I think that maybe if we don't focus on buying them, but actually try to find maybe another partnership um, where we can use the waste, especially since Indonesia has a lot of, um, is um, it's pretty big on agriculture. Yes. I think by using a partnership that we could lower the cost by, um, just collecting the waste, yeah. From whatever they produce, yeah. Because because Indonesia is a very large rice exporter, right? Along with Thailand, one of the biggest. So there must maybe even maybe even non agricultural bio waste, like um, I mean, does it have to be straw, or could it be any type of bio waste that occupies some space that could take the place of the straw? If you do that, your cost would fall drastically. <laughs> Right, because cement's only about two hundred dollars in your in your budget. Yeah, right. Um, I also actually had a question. Um, so you mentioned that you would have your plastic bottles that you were using filled with cement. So, um, where where exactly are you going to get the cement, and how? Like, from what sources? And could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, okay, well, um, cement is actually pretty accessible in Indonesia, so I guess we could just um, buy it from, there's like a lot of different um, places in Indonesia where you could buy it, so it would be pretty, like, that wouldn't really be one of our bigger problems for our structure, it's just a simple purchase. Um, I have a question. So in well, one of the problems that you identify that you want to solve with your project structure is regarding energy consumption. Um, I think the, like to my understanding, I think the only thing that I heard that was related to energy consumption is insulation. But in your presentation, you said that um, like straw bales were able to provide the same amount of insulation as um, like you wouldn't lose out on your insulation. Um, uh, the ability for no, the structure's um, ability to insulate. So, in what other ways could your solution uh, solve for the energy consumption issue? Um, so, on our second concept, 
in the exterior structure of our house, we talked about bamboo sticks and um, bamboo used in housing acts as a carbon sink, which we mentioned earlier, which helps um, reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that um, go out into the atmosphere. Thank you. Um, I think unless someone else has a quick question, I think that's all the time that we have for questions. I have a quick question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I saw that the um, the cost looks like it's um, quite. It seems pretty reasonable for for a structure that large uh, and for all the benefits it has. But I noticed that your your target demographic was people from pretty low income, um, and I'm curious: would it be possible for someone from that background to be able to afford a structure? of this cost. And I realized that uh, you mentioned partnering with different organizations like uh, Habitat for Humanity, for example, which may provide some funding. But I'm curious if it could have even more impact if you're able to um, maybe make even more use of local materials, such as using some alternative to cement or some alternative to the straw to further decrease the price, or if you can use some sort of uh, financing program so that people can pay um, you know, maybe maybe what they would typically pay for a structure that they have to rebuild every monsoon season, but then after a certain amount of time, maybe then they own the structure and uh, maybe even has a, a business structure where there's some sort of um, um, like insurance programs put in so that if it does collapse, that they have some assurance that uh, it'll be rebuilt for some cost. I'm just, I'm just curious, have you guys taken a look at um, whether this is something that uh, could could survive even without the backing of a major donor. Yeah, I think a lot of our materials are locally sourced, um, especially about the straw bale that we were talking about earlier, because that's from um, the leftover product from harvesting. And because Indonesia is very big on agriculture, if we were to actually use that um, leftover product from the harvest that these um, farmers are creating, then that will reduce our costs a lot. Um, so I think, yeah, if we do use the straw bale from the farmers and if we used a lot more locally sourced material, then we wouldn't have to rely on our partnerships that much. But um, I think the partnerships are still important just to build this like community and uh, establish this organization and um, have these people help and install like because we have the materials but we also need help in actually installing all these materials to create an actual home and i think habitat for humanity could help a lot with that sounds good i don't think we have any more time but if you guys want to answer that there's a question in the chat from one of the participants thank you for that um but thank you for your presentation we'll um move on to uh, actually i'll give them um the judges uh, a minute or two to finalize scores if they need to um so judges please enter the scores now and team four um can you get ready to screen share and present and and, and a quick reminder that presentations um will be stopped at seven minutes Um, team four, can it, do any of you have the ability to screen share your presentation? Yeah, Elisha would. Can I start? Yes, please go ahead. Alicia, Alicia, can you please press present on Google Slides so we can full, see the full screen? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Alicia, and I'm a part of Team 4. 
Um, our team mascot's name is Amnesty, and we are a group of three people. I am Alicia, and I will be starting the presentation and speaking for the first half of it. So, so firstly, um, the audience that we are aiming at for our project is low-income groups of the Himalayan region of Nepal. Um, we live in a country that is very topographically diverse. There are high mountains in the Himalayas, and we also have plain plains in the Tarai. And uh, we decided to focus on the Himalayan region of our country because that is the most un underdeveloped part of the country. Um, the government has the lowest focus on it, and the people living there are the least privileged. So we decided to we decided to focus on them as the audience for this project. So the problem that we aim to focus on is the first one is air pollution within households. So because they are, the people living there are very underprivileged, the source of firewood, the source of heat and light in uh, in the Himalayan region is firewood. People cook food using uh, firewood. And as we all know, there's a lot of carbon emission through the firewood and then um, it affects people. And as the statistics that is given here, close to 4 million people die prematurely from illness because of the household air pollution that is separated from the heat of smoke. So we decided to work on that because people from Himalayan region of Nepal go, go through similar issues every day. So we've decided an integrated kitchen structure that emphasizes on the elimination of use of polluting cook stoves. So we've decided to use, uh, we've decided to use, use a structure that is going to eliminate the smoke that uh, that is produced when we cook food. But then uh, we have also designed a structure. We've also decided. Uh, we've also designed a structure that is going to pr provide heat. The second problem that we are aiming at is waste disposal. As I mentioned, there are a lot of Himalayan, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of mountains in the Himalayan region. So there's a lot of tourism. And when tourists visit for trekking and hiking, there's a lot of litter that is all over the place. So we've also aimed at using the waste that is thrown by tourists into our solution. So moving on to our solution, we have three concepts that we have integrated into our structure. The first one is an integrated kitchen structure. The second one is um, an architecture designing of the house, which uses plastic bottles and glass panes, which I'll be talking about in a minute. And then we have wind mills. So I'll be starting with our solution number one, which is uh, the art architecture designing of our house with the use of plastic bottles and glass panes. Um, here's a link to the 3D model of our house, which it, it's not, um, we're not, we'll not be able to watch the video right now, but then I just want to show you the model. So, yeah, so this is the 3D model of our house. The basic concept that we follow is, uh, we are going to design a stove, we design, we're going to be designing a fireplace that is that will be situated outside the main area of the house. So the fireplace will be situated there and um, we'll produce, as we light firewood off, the smoke that is produced, the smoke that is produced from the firewood is going to transfer into, um, the smoke that is produced from the firewood is going to be transferred into the house by the what we're basically doing in this is that we're actually um, burning firewoods like we usually do but then we'll seal the lid as um, shown in the picture wait let me share the picture Yeah, so we can see that um, in the left corner, 
um, the firewood is burned, so the heat energy is released to the pathway that is um, to the pathway that is shown there. The heat will travel along, and then in the middle we can see that there is a metal sheet. Um, so we'll be we'll be putting the cooking wares just right above the metal sheet, and then from the heat energy that um, flows through the pathway, the uh, we can make cooking possible. Now, this idea was previously used in countries like Japan and China, um, named as integrated kitchen stove, stove oven, but then we're, we're using this for cooking purpose. And um, we were also putting a timed valve so that, um, so that maximum heat energy is used for cooking purpose. Now that the time is off, and now, now that the time uh, that we've set there, it, it's Completed, we'll open the valve and then the waste heat will travel through the pipe there. Now, um, in the structure that we've designed, we've um, covered the whole perimeter of our structure with a hollow small structure that is for collecting snow from the slopey roofs that we've constructed. Um, and then we, we, the heat energy would go through the pathway um, the, and the part that is in contact with the snow there in the hollow structure, we'll cover that with metal too. So the waste heat can also warm the snow and turn it in and melt it to water. Now, now we can use the water for our purpose. Now the remaining um, amount of smoke and a little of what is left of heat energy would go to the air purifier. And then the air purifier would absorb all the soot and smoke and the, all the dust particles and purified air will come out of the ventilator there. Now, um, the, from the air, in the air purifier, all the soot and smoke will, will stick in, the, in its interior structure. And we can use that for uh, increasing fertility of the place and also for economic purpose as there is no um, strong source of income they can sell that fertilizer and earn money too so that is it for the second for our second plan and for the third plan we have wind uh, we have windmills for uh, in, in that case we're using the plastic bottles that tourists throw there in the mountainous region what we'll do is we'll um, We'll, we'll make windmills from that and not only for the wind but as snowstorm is also a major uh, issue there will uh, the snow will also contribute to rotating the uh, rotor turbines there and then will uh, generate electricity which which we can use for our own purpose too um the, so the, yeah the last thing that we have in our structure is the roofing and um the brick insulation that we've constructed and um, Diva will follow. So basically, um, I'm going to be talking about the actual design. Uh, as you can see, this is how the uh, this is how we've designed our house to be. Um, so let's go to the front. Have, you have around a minute left. Okay. So basically, uh, this is going to be the roof, transparent roof with glass um, bottles, recycled glass bottles packed into it for insulation and to prevent heat loss. The walls would be made of mylar sheets and uh, recycled plastic bottles. And um, as you can see here, uh, Okay, so over here, we're going to be placing the wind turbines for um, during snowstorms and I, uh, okay. And this is basically our integrated st stove. Of, uh, and um, this place is for collecting the snow, which is connected to the stove. And the snow would get melted after the metal plate is heated, and we could reuse the water too. So this is basically how our model is designed, how we designed our model. And yeah, so and on as top of Neha that, and Alicia already said, mm -hmm. yeah, this is and on top of the that, basic what we construction. Is, we are recycling plastic bottles, and what we do is. Um, we congest a lot of plastic bottles together and in the roofing of our house, we design a structure where we have two glass panes, and in between those glass panes, we have congested bottle structures. So what those plastic bottles do is, they are packets of air that's, uh, that do not allow heat to radiate outside the house. So what will happen is because we have extreme cold, 
in Himalayan regions, the plastic bottle will, will act as an insulator, which will not allow the heat to pass anywhere outside the house. So a warm, warm environment will be created inside the house. And we also have minus heat that will line the walls. So we have designed in a structure which will create a very warm environment inside the house since the walls are lined with minor sheets, which also radiate heat and do not allow heat to pass outside the house. And we also have plastic bottles in the roof. So we have a very dynamic structure and um, this contributes into the whole idea of designing an eco structure and very sustainable use. Since this is very cost effective because we are basically utilizing the waste that is disposed by tourists. Um, so you, this brings uh, us- Your time um, is up right now. So um, I think we'll move on to questions right now. Um, thank you for this for the presentation. Um, do any judges have questions? I have a question. Yeah, uh, yes. awesome Good job on the, on the presentation. Uh, love, love the concept and um, yeah, really love how much you've um, really taken a look at the local environment, the problems and the resources locally and created something that really fits that area. One question that I have is, um, I, I like this concept of using the energy from the stove in a way that's much more efficient mm -hmm. because uh, you know, open fires are really inefficient. Um, one question I have is, and, and sorry if I, if I missed it, but I, I, to me, it wasn't clear what type of material, and I'm, I'm curious, what type of material do you intend to use for um, conducting the hot gases from the fire throughout the house. Um, and because uh, I'm, I'm sure it, it, you need to take some things into consideration such as making sure the material is not going to catch on fire or that it's not going to be um, such a good thermally, uh, thermal conductor that it you know, burns someone or something. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, what type of uh, materials might you use for the flooring and for the walls that would allow the hot gases to travel through, conduct their heat through it um, without posing a, a fire risk. Even though we've not looked into that very much, we're confident that we'll be able to design a structure that um, we want metal sheets to be lined up so I think uh, we're confident that we'll be able to design a structure in the future that, uh, that will help reduce uh, the chances of getting on fire. Because for now, we were only able to design the basics of it because we have three structures that we planned. So, so yeah, that, that's it. Okay, uh, yeah, make sure. And, and I saw that it looks like this is um, uh, something similar has been done in the past, maybe during uh, from the Roman period or something. So it, it looks like it, it's definitely um, definitely feasible. I was just curious if you if you had a material in mind. I think mica sheets would be a good material for that. We were hoping, yeah. I have a question. Uh, which element of your design do you think would be the most expensive? Mm -hmm. Since we're using recycled bottles for insulation and walls, and we're using um, mylar sheets, which are from inside the plastic wrappers and chip wrappers. So um, even the wind turbines are from recycled bottles. Uh, I guess the stove would be the most expensive part. Yeah, sounds like it. I'm, I'm curious, what, what is the solution now to deal with the trash bags and water bottles that the tourist trekkers leave? Does the government take care of it or is it just left out, um, unpicked up? Uh, it, yeah, that, yes, that has become, that has been posing a really huge problem because it has been left uh, ignored. It has been completely ignored by the government. Oh, so and then there are huge, yeah, we have huge dumping sites. And what the government does is uh, it collects all the waste that, that is left on roads and then they dump it in dumping sites. And it just- And even rivers. On on. Yes. Yeah, in rivers, 
that has been another problem because in our country the river flows from Himalayan to Sarai region. So mm. the river is initiated in the in the in the hills of mountains. Mm. So what happens is because the litter is let out into the rivers, the whole country is polluted. So yes. the Himalayan region is basically the root of all the problems that arise in other parts of our country. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Well, thank you. Your solution gets rid of trash and provides low-cost building material. That's an elegant solution. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You have um, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, judges, please finalize your scores for uh, Team 4. And just a quick uh, reassurance that uh, we know that Team 4 is encountering some Wi-Fi issues, so you won't be marked out or anything for that. Thank you. Uh, team 7 is next, so if Team 7 could, if someone from Team 7 could be ready, uh, screen share, and if um, Alicia, you could stop screen sharing. Yeah, I guess I'll screen share. Okay, hello everybody. So we are team seven, Rania, Azu, Siri, and Cynthia. Um, so from different places, and this is our amazing mascot. Anyway, so we have, yeah, you can move on. Okay, so we have been looking at cost versus sustainability because both are very important and it's been hard to balance them out. Um, but also we have focused on the impact our buildings would have on the communities. Now, the three concepts we have looked at specifically are the water systems, which we want to make circular, and the electricity supply, which um, we hope to make solar because this would benefit communities off grid. Uh, we also hope that our um, house would not only help the people living in it, but the communities around it. And the final concept we have looked uh, in depth at is the material, which we want to both be uh, low carbon when building it, so locally sourced, but also in the low in the long term help conserve energy. Mm -hmm. So to address the problem, we based our structure off of Peronican houses in the picture on the slide, which are basically like two story simple houses that sort of are connected together. So inspired by this property of this architecture, we basically decided to create a house that can be scaled and built multiple times to create a community. We decided to focus on finding a solution for low income families living in the slums and our concepts take into account the humidity, the dry and rainy seasons of the tropic areas we're focusing on, self-sustainability, eco-friendliness, and affordability. So our aim is to find a balance between all of these factors through the three main concepts we have, which are materials, water systems, and energy. So for the structure and the insulation, for the outer walls, we will be using bamboo, which will be covered with mud. And since mud does not react fairly well to wet season, in order to prevent those problems, uh, we will cover the mud with calcium carbonate. And it, the mud, mud structures are known to be extremely uh, st stable and durable. So, and they will also provide protection from the humid weather. Okay. Um, so this house um, is also based off a tiny house. Um, and so tiny houses are known to have less carbon emissions overall. And also, um, we decided to have a 10 square meter um, surface area to combat the increasing population density um, in rural areas as well as urban areas. Um, and so although it is 10 meters uh, 
10 square meters per floor um, in order to still ensure the luxury and the comfort of each family. Um, we also like a two-story two -story building um, per house. And so um, I'll now talk about the, the roof. And so um, the base of the roof is essentially a bamboo and banana fiber roof, um, which if you remember was inspired from Dr. Bailey's, um, Professor Bailey's um, project in Sri Lanka. And then on top of that, we're planning to have a core clear for insulation, um, which is damp, is, which is also damp proof and um, and has a relatively low cost. And on top of that, um, we're going to have a roof garden um, to collect rainwater and um, for for our circular water system. All right, so moving on to the water systems, our goal was to design a truly self-sustainable water system. So our design would allow inhabitants to obtain both food and water in an eco-friendly manner. So we have a rooftop garden where inhabitants can grow their food and their plants, and the base is slanted so that when the rain falls and seeps into the dirt and through the rocks, the water gathers at one place ready to be filtered. Then to minimize cost, we decided to create a filter out of fine sand pebbles, coffee filter paper, charcoal, and cloth. So this is enough to make the water usable for sinks and showers, but not yet drinkable. So to make the water drinkable, we also plan on installing a switch on the tap in the house that would provide an additional layer of filtration that would make the water drinkable. So this total would cost less than 200 USD. So that way it's cost-friendly and eco-friendly. So after filtration, the used water as shown in the diagram, it would then go into the sewage where it gets refiltered and sent back into the houses. In terms of the water system and pipage, we plan on using a bamboo pipage system for sustainability and affordability. So one bamboo stick around two to three meters long costs less than one US dollar when ordered in bulk, which means that $220 in USD is more than enough to install all the pipes we need in the house. In addition, using bamboo would reduce carbon emissions and would achieve our goal of eco-friendliness and affordability. So an alternate solution, next slide. An alternate solution we came up with was the idea of a very large water filtration facility. So Orange County in California has this system and it's proven to work really well for them and even saves their energy in the end. So this facility basically has the ability to turn sewage water into drinking water through three main processes, which is microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and UV disinfectation. So in the first step, microfiltration, the sewage water would go through lots of super tiny fiber membrane tubes, which would get rid of any bacteria and solids in the water. Then the water goes through these special plastic sheets to undergo reverse osmosis, which takes out viruses and blocks other substances, even as small as a molecule. Then to further purify the water it is put through steel tanks with ultraviolet light bulbs in it, which is a type of technology that's able to eliminate viruses, fungi, mold, bacteria, and other particles, which allows the water to be purified above federal and state standards. So one of these facilities would be really costly, but one facility is enough to supply an entire county or state with water. So the cost would be worth it. In addition, the government would most likely be the one investing in this as it is a facility that can help entire cities and counties. So this can purify water on a large scale for communities, but another system that is on a smaller scale is a biodigester. Next slide. Okay, so to finish the circle of the circular water system, we have been looking at a solution to the poor sewage systems, which are now in slums. And so, yes, the solution would be a biodigester. Um, and the biodigester could be used not only for this household, but also um, for the rest of the community to improve the health and well being of more people. So a biodigester um, transforms sewage water into reusable water, which can go back into the system, and methane. Now the methane can be burnt um, as a biogas to cook food, and it is a lot cleaner than other fossil fuels and also does not cause as much air pollution, which is very good for the people in the household. The biodigester also produces fertilizer, which can be put back into the roof garden. Now, the biodigester um, not only um, prevents 
people and their households from polluting the surrounding natural environment, but also gives back by, um, you know, composting and creating fertilizer. Uh, but it also helps the people in the community by increasing the sanitation standards and reducing the spreading of disease. Um, so now I'll be talking about the um, key aspect of energy. And so solar energy and through solar panels is the cheapest um, source of, of electricity in history. Yes, the installation costs are really high, but um, when you analyze long-term costs in comparison to fossil fuels, um, it does it is much cheaper. And so um, after doing our calculations, we realized that we would need one solar, uh, one solar panel per two houses. And in our community home um, system of 12, 12 houses, we would need um, a total of six solar panels. And so um, like along with, along with our entire project, um, which is based on the idea of commu community, um, solar panels are also going to be communal. And this is because solar energy needs to be used immediately. And so um, when, it is, uh, when it's used for um, a communal purpose, it can be used immediately and um, be catered to each house's needs. And to increase its efficiency um, of, and, like, of converting energy into, into electrical energy um, and also uh, would, be cost, would increase the cost efficiency, um, we could angle it differently, um, face it in the optimal direction to uh, gain the most sunlight and um, install reflectors as well as, as maintain um, the solar panels by cleaning it once annually. And um, um, also I've, um, because, because um, we would immediately use the energy, um, it, it would be more cost efficient because um, the because when we aren't able to use energy immediately, they can be stored into batteries, uh, which would help conserve energy for seasons with less um, sunlight as well as nighttime. Okay, so now we will be talking about the affordability aspect of this project. We are aware that the cost is especially high. However, this cost takes into account the solar panels, um, as well as the mud house, which are the highest uh, sources of cost for our house. But the solar panels, as Arzu mentioned, are for communal uses usage because uh, solar panels provide a lot of energy that can partly be uh, co conserved for use for using uh, during rainy seasons, since there are low amounts of sunlight and heat during those seasons. And it can also be used uh, to power other houses as well. So it will be distributed throughout the community. Um, and for mud houses, as I mentioned earlier, uh, are very, um, are durable and very sturdy. And the more we use bamboo and mud materials, the more these houses are built, these materials will be produced at a bulk, which would actually reduce the cost. So over time, the cost of building this house would decrease. And um, we wanted to make sure that the inhabitants of this house did have a great standard of living. Uh, ours, next slide. Okay, so for the strengths of our project, the structure, uh, mud and bamboo, uh, our materials are cheaper compared to brick and steel, which corporate buildings tend to use. But even though they are cheaper, they are very stable. And since we are using the calcium carbonate, they will be applicable for all weather conditions. And as I mentioned earlier, the mud will have a, um, will have a cooling, uh, will not absorb as much heat like concrete does, so it will use less energy. And the water system, we, there will be less water wastage compared to other, um, other houses uh, as we will reuse the water and we will create methane for biogas and it is a circular water system. And the energy, solar energy is very cheap and it is cost efficient. It uh, releases less amount of greenhouse gases and it is suitable for tropical locations. Uh, so the purpose, purpose of, uh, architecture is to ensure the best quality of living for all inhabitants and we wanted to make sure that that was uh, addressed in this project so we would not only like to address the daily uh, chores of these inhabitants we would also like to make sure that the quality of the water and the structure and everything is 
uh, healthy and um, great uh, in order to ensure better mental well-being for them. So with that, we would like to interrupt, but you are over time. So I'll give you 10 to 15 seconds to wrap up. Yeah, we'll have to go move on to questions. Uh, it's fine. I've concluded already. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, judges, questions? I, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that the, the mud, oh, by the way, love, love the presentation. Um, uh, one thing that I think is really interesting is, is I feel like a lot of what you're presenting is, I like how you showed not just one structure, but also another use of the water system for purification of water for a whole community. So I feel like rather than a specific design, you're also describing an, a new sort of methodology of creating a building that can be very self-sustaining um, and, and self-reliant, which I think is really cool. Uh, I'm really curious in particular about your, your, your um, the mud walls, because um, I was kind of surprised by how high the cost was for, for the mud, since I, I usually think of mud as being more or less free. Uh, but I noticed you also mentioned that you can coat it with calcium carbonate, which can help to help its um, resilience in water. And I'm curious how um, uh, how the calcium carbonate, um, how it works, how it helps the mud, and uh, maybe how you thought to use it, because I think it uh, sounds really interesting. So um, mud structures are very durable in dry seasons. And while uh, tropical uh, locations uh, do have dry seasons, there are also many rainy and wet seasons. So in order to make sure that that did not become an issue for the mud houses, uh, we figured that ca uh, calcium carbonate should be used. And so earlier during, while writing uh, a while working on our project, we uh, talked to Arzu's dad, who actually works with these structures, and he gave us sort of an idea of what these houses could look like. And he stated that instead of using like a physical plaster, like uh, using a calcium carbonate would be a better solution uh, in order to provide um, better safety for um, monsoon season and like cyclones and all that stuff. And I'd like to add that this is because um, the soil and the mud involved compresses and um, expands really easily, and so the carbon uh, and so the calcium carbonate is kind of used to um, be as uh, to stop the compressing and expanding. Oh, interesting. Um, I had a question, and I just first wanted to start off by saying, like, um, really great job focusing on the community aspect too. I really, I really enjoyed. Um, hearing about how you can really scale up your the, the idea that you proposed. Um, so my question was, you were in one of your slides, you were talking about the water filtration system on a large scale. I wanted to know, like you, you said that the, the cost for this would be really um, would be higher, but you know it would really benefit a whole community and in the end, um, you know, be able to save people a lot of money. How would you? My question is, I guess, why haven't communities done this already? Do you know any information about, you know, what's what are the obstacles to people already starting this and how you could overcome some of those obstacles? Um, well, I think, first of all, one of those large facilities would take around like millions of dollars to construct because it also requires a lot of power needed to push the water through the plastic sheets for reverse reverse osmosis as well as microfiltration and so because for microfiltration you need around 600 horsepower to push it through and for the reverse osmosis you need around 1000 horsepower so it does take a lot of energy to be able to figure this out however the good part is that at least in california what they found is that this actually uses less energy than if they were to take pump water from a new, a new water source, especially if they have to pump it uphill. So this actually saves more energy than a traditional way. However, it's really costly to install. Like one of these facilities in the Orange County in California took hundreds of million dollars, millions of dollars of USD to install. So in places less, so in places that aren't financially as well off, this the cost itself could be a possible obstacle that the country government has to overcome in order to install it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll move on to 
Team 13 now. If someone from Team 13 could uh, start screen sharing and judges finalize your scores for Team 7. I just want to remind you that um, your presentation can be a maximum of seven minutes long. Um, I guess just tell us when we can start. Yeah. Um, just we'll wait a minute or two while we can finalize course for Team 7. Okay, they're just going to quickly wrap up their scores for Team 7 and move on. Um, why don't you just start now? Okay. Um, so our problem that we chose to address in Team 13 was um, homelessness, specifically in Los Angeles County, where um, we are based. Um, and the reason that we specifically addressed this issue and we thought that it was important is um, that Dr. Bailey had mentioned that it was really important to locally understand the issue. Um, and so as a group, we kind of collectively decided to do this. So um, as you can see on that graph, uh, homelessness has uh, grown uh, almost exponentially um, and continues to, especially through the pandemic. Um, uh, we're just kind of receiving data of, of what that effect has had um, on people now, but uh, you can see that over 66,000 people and counting um, uh, live on the streets of Los Angeles. This creates um, a lot of hazards um, for both people living on the streets and also um, people living in the communities that, um, that homelessness happens in. Um, our audience is, of course, uh, people living on the streets. Um, as of right now, the city provides uh, minimal resources, uh, but it, usually it comes down to uh, police having to forcibly remove people, um, and that doesn't really solve the issue. So we first identified that um, in order to solve this issue, we need to provide shelter first. Um, and secondly, we needed to uh, provide a way for them to attain skills um, and get a job in order to support themselves, um, and in some cases, their family. Oh. Our target audience was specifically homeless people. So we had a example person that we use to be able to really um, understand the problem and really solve the issue specifically taking in mind of homelessness people. Um, so Steve um, is 56. He has been homeless for two years. Um, he, he suffers from PTSD from his time in the war. Um, he has been living in a tent under the freeway um, in, at Ven in Venice Boulevard. Um, his only income right now is collecting bottles. Uh, he has no utilities and he has to share one portable toilet with everyone else under the bridge. When it rains, all his stuff is ruined. He cannot leave his belongings because people can steal it when he has to go collecting. Um, so we decided to um, let him have an opportunity to make more money um, by doing the thing he does, by helping him um, when he collects trash, he will be able to um, pay, uh, get paid for that um, so he can build composite um, 
when he collects trash. Um, yeah. Okay, so a little bit more in depth about this solution. Um, Dr. Bailey had mentioned that we needed to consider the uh, economic, the environmental, as well as the um, social impact that um, our solution has. So we decided to approach this from a, a, a view of addressing all of those needs. Um, so our solution includes um, modular mobile structures that are set up in tiny home villages. Um, these shelters have full utilities, a bed, um, and can be added onto their modular to accommodate four to five people. Um, they give the homeless a sense of safety um, and they're a place to, to store their stuff. Their carbon footprint is also reduced due to the um, construction methods um, that we will be talking about later. Um, embedded job, job opportunities. Um, homeless will be able to bring plastic waste they have collected to a location. Um, uh, a warehouse that uh, will hopefully be provided by the city, uh, they will receive comp compensation for collecting the waste. Uh, the manufacturing of these composite panels uh, to make the structures will employ the homeless as well. Um, and that will provide opportunities. Um, they will be taught to make, uh, they also be taught to make different items out of recycled waste that could be sold as a profit for themselves. The basic module will be built on an eight foot by 12 foot platform. The walls will be composed of four foot by two foot composite panels that will be made by the one worker per participant. The basic panels can be cut as necessary to accommodate non scattered dimensions. The modules will have two basic configurations, a living space and a kitchen and bathroom space. Multiple living spaces can be connected to a single kitchen bathroom module. The module can be loaded on a flatbed truck with a forklift to be transported to another location. So one of our main like goals was to make sure that our structure could be mobile, sort of like an RV. And our walls were sort of inspired by how RV walls are made, which has an uh, exterior layer, insulation layer, and uh, interior. Um, so basically, the way we're going to make our materials is by a process that takes the collected um, plastic and wood that the homeless people collect from around their areas. And they can be turned into a um, wood plastic composite, which is basically done by turning the wood into a fine dust. And then the plastic flakes are heated down to uh, resin. And then they are extruded through a machine and cooled, which makes the wood plastic composite um a very good benefit to wpcs is that they don't corrode and they're highly resistant to rot and decay unlike wood we chose um wpc because it's very similar to rv panels which was made for strength and durability another main issue that we had was thinking about how much trash homeless people generate and how much is just lying around. So a big part of this material choice was being able to use trash generated by homeless people. Um, our wood composite is pretty easy to produce, has good thermal insulation, and has a really good texture that can be made to look like wood to make it visually appealing for everyone. In addition to the insulation from the WPCs, we are offering vinyl wallpaper in exchange for trash made from PVC or polyvinyl chloride, such as PVC pipes, some containers, a lawn chair, plastic wraps, tablecloth, uh, shower curtain, etc. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, no. 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 No.
Oh, what did you say? Sorry. This is the wrong slide. Uh, the, the previous slide is my slide. The slide before that is uh, with the. Oh no, I was talking to uh to Shivy. What what were you saying? You have one minute to go. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just need the slide to be there anyway. So uh, so there's a huge huge boom of construction in Los Angeles, California. This has resulted in, in a lot of waste. And the city of Los Angeles has a program where, as part of obtaining a building permit, LA County Public Works Building and Safety Division may refer a project to the Environmental Programs Division to obtain approval of a construction and demolition debris right recycling and reuse plan. That's from the LA County website. Construction and demolition waste includes steel, wood products, plaster and drywall, brick, concrete, and asphalt. Um, wood and wood products can be reused and any and all rubble can be compressed and reused. Um, construction blocks from, made from 25% plastic have, have performed well in lab tests, not special plastic, it's from everyday trash and homeless encampments produce a lot of it. Um, the trash contains materials which will be combined with the construction waste to produce panels that will be used to create the overall structure, which will be um, an eco-friendly way of reusing both trash and both trash from people and trash from other structures. So that way there's multiple kinds of recycling in one building. The three main types of um the three main points that we really focused on were um, energy, sewage, and water. Um, energy, we thought to use uh, solar panels so we would be able to, um, uh, so we would be able to uh, give them a heat, um, power, um, sewage. We would just use uh, the same, a system similar to RVs to store their sewage um, and then dump and then give it, um, dump it later. And then water, we would use a gray water system, which we would be able to use um, bath water um, to flush toilets and water plants. Sorry to cut you off, but that's time. Uh, we'll move on to questions now. Yeah, uh, that's the conclusion, so thank you. Uh, judges, if you have any questions. Well, I have a question regarding something that Dr. Carolyn Bailey talked about in her last few moments of her speech. She said that she actually wanted some help from young people to deal with the issue of fire resistance in materials. In your design, you make use of a large number of manufactured and processed materials. I'm wondering what kinds of issues regarding fire protection might there be? Um, have you looked into the relative fire resistance of some of your materials that you propose? Uh, yes, so WPCs are inherently more flammable than wood because it has plastic parts in it. Mm -hmm. So we sort of incorporated that in our design by making most of like the heat um, come from electricity rather than like an open fire and mm -hmm. sort of not allowing open fires near the wood. Yeah, I would definitely say that fires in encampments is a big issue. And so that would be taken very seriously in building these um, tiny house villages. You also mentioned that you wanted to train the homeless people to make some products out of the trash. Uh, were you referring to the building materials themselves or are we or were you referring to other products too? So the 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 training itself would be um, there's kind of three sections with the gray water that EC's yeah. mentioned that yeah. comes into gardening and so that's something oh. um, through the farmers market. Okay. Um, another another thing was uh, the actual manufacturing and that's oh. that's another thing as well as just uh, technical skills in uh, making items with recycled goods that that would also be um, offered. Would, would the last one be for consumers, like retail consumers, or would it be something for industry, like the construction industry? Yeah, so that goes for everything. So the 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 plants produced by the garden could be used in the uh, village itself or consumer. Um, the the items made mm -hmm. could be consumer or used. 
Um, and then the manufacturing itself could also be um, consumer or uh, used back into the village. Thank you. Some of the images you showed in a slideshow, actually, I've seen driving around LA. <laughs> so they're very relevant where I live. Definitely. That's why we, we, we all live in LA County. So we decided that focusing on a local issue would make the most impact for ourselves. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, judges, if you could um, finalize your scores um, and then uh, we'll move on to our last finalist, which is Team 6. Um, thank you so much, Team 13. Um, and if someone from Team 6 gets furniture. Um, Shrey, how do I share my screen? There should be a, a button at the bottom, um, a green button saying share screen. It's kind of showing unknown tabs for me. Um, give me a second, please. Yeah, if you're unable to, um, um, I or Peter can also share our screens with your presentation. Uh, yeah, can you do that, please? Um, I, I don't think it's working out for me. Sure. Um, Peter, do you have it open? Presentation? You're muted. Yep, I'll show the screen for team six. Let me see. Um, hang on. Should we start? Yeah, just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Oh, oh okay, okay. Um, so hello everyone, this is team number six here and we, our team mascot's name is Vism, which is actually vision in Latin. And the name of our team's project structure is called Breathing Waterfall. And it's kind of an interesting name that you might think and I'll, and we'll introduce that later. So then what is the problem that our project solves with our project structure? Um, so the problems that our team solves uh, with our project structures are wastewater management, carbon, carbon footprint of construction materials, light consumption, high level of energy consumption on just heating and cooling, and poor insulation throughout the building. Um, next slide, please. So then who is the audience that our team serves with our project structure? So as you can see, our audience is a family of 34 that live near the distance of 4,000 kilometers to the equator line in South and Southeast Asia. So then you might be wondering, why do we want to set such a huge range, which is a distance of 4,000 kilometers to the equator line? So then, and why we're limiting to just South and Southeast Asia. So if we look at countries like Nepal, which is about 3,000 kilometers away from the equator line, and we look at countries like Bangladesh and India, we'll notice that they all have something in similar, and that will be their climate. So then, which is the tropical climate. So that means the temperature change would the range would be within 15 Celsius degrees to 32 Celsius degrees, and that there are normally three seasons. And that one thing that our range was so big is also because there are approximately 2.5 billion of the population that lives in South and Southeast Asia. So we thought by addressing such a huge population with simple yet efficient tactics and strategies that we can use to, let's say, improve efficient, um, green energy efficiency, we are able to reduce um, carbon footprint by a global scale. Next slide, please. So then what is the solution that our team created? So our team has um, outlined four eco-friendly concepts. The first one will be our bamboo rain collection system. And it will be able to scroll, store approximately 30,000 gallons of water throughout the year. And that is at least two to three times the um, water, um, water consumption of a household. So then the second one is the use of natural lightings. And we will be doing that through using big glass panels and then coordinating that with where the sun rises and where the sun sets. And by using these, we maximize the sunlight time that is in the house. So then our third solution will be a terrace garden used to reduce the temperature in the first floor by six to eight degrees Celsius. And our last simple but um, dress, could be drastic um, solution is green roof that increases insulation 
thus reducing our cooling and heating costs, which actually account for 47% of our household energy consumption. And one thing I want to mention is that these ideas often contain the use of bamboo. If we look at areas in South Asia, Asia and Southeast Asia, we'll notice that, for example, countries like Vietnam, there are lots of bamboos there and we can utilize them greatly since they are, first of all, cost efficient. And they also replaces, for example, plastic substitutes, um, I'm sorry, plastic, which means they're able to serve as an efficient substitute, reducing carbon footprint and also um, cement. Next slide, please. Um, okay, the first uh, prop the first solution that we propose is bamboo rain collection system. The rain collection system uh, is um, somewhat of a familiar concept when it comes to um, environmental friendly options that we can incorporate in our houses. But we're, but in our part, we have included bamboo because um, as um, Baldwin has already mentioned before, as we are looking into countries uh, in the tropical region, which means that bamboo is readily available as well as uh, bamboo is something uh, is um, grows at a very high rate so and with that bamboo can also be replaced without having any major um, harmful um, waste material and uh, with that um, bamboo can also last up to five years if untreated and if treated properly it can last up to 10 years and why is it needed? Because uh, rainwater can substitute for high level water consumption activities as simple as toilet flushing. So then I would like to add on by elaborating on why bamboo is such an important thing, because, for example, in Vietnam or even in some other countries with bamboos, um, definitely a lot in South Asia and Southeast Asia, it can grow as fast as to 32 inch per day. And that is a lot of bamboos, if you imagine, because usually bamboos don't come in just a single stick, right? We come in like bamboo farms. And if we just imagine this, then we can actually use bamboo, which is really cost efficient, well, we, it also has greater tensile strength than metal. So by that, we mean that it's able to stretch more efficiently and maybe surviving more natural disasters in that case. Next slide, please. So then um, this comes down to calculating the efficiency of our bamboo rain collection system. So then this, um, the, on the top, you see the calculation to show credibility of our effectiveness. So we kind of make an assumption. So we know that our roof is about a thousand and a hundred square feet. And that means that each inch of rain will yield around 660 gallons of water. And assuming that the average of rainfall near the South Asia and Southeast Asia region is around 120 inches. This means that we're able to store up to oh, 330,681,680 um, gallons of water. And if you actually look closely we actually assume the efficiency of the water collection system is 40% because we know that it's impossible that a rain collection system will be able to collect up to maybe even 100% or 80% or even 60%. So we have lowered it down, lowered the efficiency to only 40%. And that still gives us 31,680 gallons of water. And so how effective it is in real life. So if we look at Kathmandu, for example, on average, um, per household uses around 75 liters of water Per day. So then that is equal to around 7,235 gallons of water annually. So then being able to store a total sum of 30,000 gallons of water provides more than enough for a family and even for a small community. And now this deals a lot with our region, right? Because after all, our main goal is to reduce carbon emission by a global scale. And by using, um, by using such cheap solutions that is able to save up so much water, we can reduce the um, terrible impacts that is caused by the waste of water. Next slide, please. Okay, the second uh, uh, solution that we propose to our problem is a natural lighting. So what this does is it uh, decreases the energy consumption uh, by nearly 50% uh, as an average household in the US uses about 45 light bulbs. And uh, how we deal with this is a uh, large window uh, uh, planes and insulation tape which is used to seal leaks in windows and gaps around the house, which increases, which in then increases um, the insulation. Uh, so then oh, just, sorry. Um, uh, oh, sorry, previous slide please. Um, yes. So then this means that if we utilize natural lighting enough and turn on the light bulb for only four hours a day, we can cut down 50% of the carbon emissions from light bulb. And now we're 
ju just be aware that the calculations are we're using LED light bulbs. Imagine in some developing countries in let's say Southeast Asia, right? Not many people are aware of um, LED light bulbs. So that means there's a high possibility that they're using incandescent or let's say classic light bulbs. And that is around 152.42 kg of carbon dioxide produced annually. So then by cutting down 50% of the carbon emissions, we could be cutting down maybe 10,000 kilograms of carbon emissions just by reducing the use of light bulbs. I didn't drop the ever a minute left. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So then terrace garden ratio, um, we, um, patio. So this is like a small patio in which we have installed on the second story of our house. It can reduce the downstairs indoor temperature by six to eight degrees. And it is really efficient because you see we have made the soil containers out of bamboo ourselves. And it is also very cost efficient. As you can see, the total cost is only $150. And $100 are spent on supplies, while well, $50 are spent on the bamboos. So it's actually very cost efficient. Next slide, please. And then last, our, last of our concept, it's simple, it's green roof. But the green roof is first laid with gold sedum, then it's covered with fines. Gold sedum is a type of leaf in which it is cheap and requires low maintenance. It only requires about around $100 to cover the entire roof with gold sedum and vines. And these could gain up to extra 25% insulation in dry conditions. And as you can see, could reduce heat loss due to wind by up to 50%. Next slide. So then we're coming all together. As you can see, this is a 3D model of the concepts combined in the presentation. We have the terrace garden patio on the second floor. We have the bamboo rain collection system and we have the green roof. Then the uses of natural lighting through big windows. One of our focus is to provide something. As you can see with the cost, the total cost is only $1,312. And actually 635 is just spent on the rain collection system and 526 is spent on natural lighting. So just imagine this. If Two point, if the 2.5 billion population that lives in South Asia and Southeast Asia simply use the terrace garden patio and the green roof, think about how much global um, um, carbon emissions were able to reduce. It's actually a really large scale and it is also energy efficient at the same time. Yeah, so, right, thank you. Uh, we'll go on to questions now. Uh, I really appreciate the level of analysis your team produced. When you lay out your assumptions and your calculations, it gives you so much more credibility. I, I've, I do have one question. You mentioned that the eco-friendly rain collection system cost about half of the total budget. And I noticed that you use plastic 5,000 liter tubs. Is there a cheaper way to, to address that issue other than plastic tubs? Um, so according to our research, there is a cheaper alternative. No, there is not a cheaper alternative, but we can use uh, concrete rings, but that again produces uh, more carbon emission because that construction material in itself is not eco-friendly. With that, over time, it also, um, it also increases the chances of moss um, around the water, which makes it unsanitary, whereas the plastic tanks could be washed and if kept properly, will last uh, for about 15 to 30 years. So they're kind of um, like a one, um, and then later they can be cut and used for terrace gardening as well. So it's Thank kind you. of, um, later we can use it for terrace gardening as well. Thank you. I'll just like to add on to that because a, a lot of these problems, we also have to think about the balance between being eco-friendly and how much people are actually being able to afford, right? Yes. So that, um, if we go to, let's say um, the, so, um, the glasses, right? The natural lighting itself costs $500. The reason we did not find a substitute for the glass panels is because yes, there are substitutes and yes, they are more eco-friendly. However, we have to be aware that we are talking about a region of developing countries. These countries, it takes more money for them to gain these eco-efficient technologies than to actually produce them. So the actual, so the actual more eco-efficient substitutes for glass such as Liprotex and things like that. These are actually much more expensive than glasses. Oh, thank you. With that, like Baldwin added, we are talking about insulin, um, in insulation tapes, but a, a more, another alternative could have been will, uh, woolen fibers, but in mm. turn, they turn out to be more expensive. And that is something that um, the people that we're aiming at will not be able to um, afford time and again. I appreciate the level of, of research you've performed. Thank you. Thank you for your very thorough answers. Thank you.
Thank you. I uh, actually have one more question as well. Um, so you mentioned that in your uh, in your examples for the water uh, collection, I think you mentioned that you were um, first you talked about how like the average uh, amount of rainfall in these tribal areas. Then you talked about an example in Kathmandu, which of course might be different from uh, rainfall in different areas, like more tropical areas, maybe such as Indonesia or something. Um, how did you account for that? About how it's not actually going to be similar in all areas near the equator. Um, so we have accounted that because, um, for example, when we're calculating the efficiency, right, just by, let's say some region, we, we actually found the average of several regions like Dhaka, Nepal, um, Dhaka, ne Dhaka, Kathmandu, and then um, and Bombay. So we figure out the average of several regions to take this into consideration. And that is why we have chosen to calculate it um, with an average of 120 inches of rain per year. Um, judges, if you could finalize your scores. Well, one other question. I noticed you mentioned that during a wet season, the use of water was 85 liters per person, which compared to 70 liters in dry season. That's, that sounds a bit counterintuitive. Why would you need more water in a wet season? I think it's more about saving because during the dry season, you're more likely to be like, there's oh. less water. So like, you're going to be more efficient about how you're going to use it. But during the rainy season, you're more going to be more liberal about it. And sometimes um, some places they don't have, um, let's say, well-established rain collection systems. So then it really leads to these loss of water. And then since they're not able to collect this much of water anyways, they have decided to use more of these water to get the most out of it. I had a question. Um, it was more so about just like um, looking into you know, you were talking about how there's 2.5 billion people in Southeast Asia. And if, you know, so a bunch of them use this type of housing, they could um, really benefit from it, which I totally agree with. How would you, you know, in the real world, like going out, how would you introduce this type of housing and, and make it um, appealing for people? And how would you, you know, you know, present them with a, a this option as something that they could really um, benefit from? Um, so then I think this also has to deal with a lot of external factors, such as how the government chooses to limit these things and whether these things are taught regularly in school, because like the rain collection system, it's regular in some regions because we are taught, right? We know that these systems exist. However, in some regions, it's not that clear of a knowledge that these things exist. So by, for example, Although this is less realistic because governments have to consider lots of things, if the governments, let's say, choose to encourage eco-friendly um, materials or maybe establishment by providing some form of aids, this would definitely help establishing um, some sort of eco-friendly system around it. Okay, if judges could find my scores and. Can I just go back and answer that question real quick? Like, I think I forgot to address one of the things. So then it, it was because how these can, these eco-friendly concepts can benefit the households, right? Like if we are talking about develop, um, like people who are living in slums, like why would they want to consider any of these? So then obviously insulation deals with a lot of these because in temperature changes, right? Some people do not have the access to, let's say, blankets. So then they would be cold during winter, but by providing some sort of insulation or just the purchase, purchase of some insulation tape and then air tape and then taping the air leaks around the housing, they can um, increase the insulation and therefore there will not be as much temperature change as there would be without it. 
also I feel like the the solutions that we have proposed might be attractive to um, the people of that region because it's something that they can actually implement on it implemented by themselves by working by themselves with the resources that's available to them around them. So that also might encourage them to be more readily um, okay with um, like using these solutions. And one of the prompts in our thing was around um, designing eco-friendly concepts for a family household that's three to four people, right? But then on, let's say in the US, the housing, um, the house would be as big as 1,600 1, square feet, or it could even go up to 2,000. But then let's be more realistic and let's talk about slums, right? They can be as small as just maybe a few square feet or like tens, right? So then this means that the cost is actually not as high as up to $150. Just by some sort of, let's say, just buying some seeds and spreading on the roof and covering it, covering the roof with some type of soil and then growing some seeds. This is some really easy method of insulation in which people can implement. Thank you, Baldwin. Thank you, team. Thank you, team six. Um, the judges are ready now and it is now time to announce the winners. Trey, over to you. Uh, yeah, so you uh, keep going. Um, so Congratulations to uh, uh, to team uh, to team four and seven for being runners up, so second and third place. Um, uh, you had the second and third highest scores. Um, and finally, congratulations to team six, Baldwin and Abilasha for uh, for winning. Um, you had conclusively the highest score. Um, so yes, congratulations. Uh, and if there's any other teammates, also I, I know you two are the only person to presenting today, but, and then finally, I want to thank also team 10 and 13. You were close, but unfortunately we couldn't have five winners, but yes, congratulations for being finalists and you'll also be especially recognized on our website. Um, we'll be sending certificates soon to everyone, but um, special ones to uh, finalists and winners and, and, and the same thing for the feature on our website after. Um, Shivi? Yeah, so, this is how the certificates are going to look. Um, we'll have your names here. And um, we've already talked about how you're gonna be featured on our website. Thank you so much to all our participants. Uh, it's been so nice to have you and we've really enjoyed the entire process, uh, getting to know you, getting to know your ideas and um, great job everyone. Uh, and now we have time to just hang out, have some fun. Yeah, if anyone wants to stay behind, continue to talk about um, about the ideas or just in general talk, please feel free to stay behind and we'll be sending out emails. Um, uh, well, an email with the, uh, with the feedback form for us so we could kind of improve or if we want to do this again and, and see what we did good and what we did bad. Um, and then we'll also be uh, sending us uh, a little later an email about more details for the design lab, how to apply to that. Oh, actually, yeah, Shivi sent the feedback form in the chat. So if you could fill that out, we would really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, we'll be sending an email with more details about um, the design we'll have soon. And, um, um, and